All right. Uh, can anybody, everybody hear me? Yeah, great. All right, let's get started. We have a lot to uh, go through today, so I'm going to have to rush things a little bit. Apologies in advance. <coughs> so this is where we left things off last week. Right, we discussed what machine learning is and how we do it in general, and we discussed that in terms of this basic recipe where we uh, take a data set, we choose features, we choose instances, choose a model class, search for a model class, all of that. This week we're not going to talk about that. We've seen a few examples of that, hopefully enough to, to give you an idea of how this sort of thing works. This week we're going to, do, to talk about the data science, basically what happens before you start doing this and what happens after you uh, finish doing this. So today we will see, after you've trained a model, how you look at that model and see, is it a good model? And if you have two models, which of them is the best? Which should you choose? And then on Thursday, we'll see what we do before we uh, start doing machine learning, how we prepare the data, how we, uh, uh, yeah, how we prepare the data. So this is the plan for today. Uh, so I'll start by going through the basics. Let me write a little bigger. I'll start by going through the basics of how you perform a machine learning experiment. Uh, which is very straightforward, but there's some subtleties to take into account. Then, once the experiment is finished, what do we report? How do we analyze the result? If we have trained a classifier, then the break. Then the same thing but for regression, which is a little simpler. And then finally, hopefully I'll leave myself enough time, we'll talk about something called the no free lunch theorem, which is sort of a theoretical answer to the question of which model is the best in general, which approach to learning is the best in all situations. So sort of before you've seen the data, what model should you pick? So let's get started. Um, so we'll talk about classification most of the time, uh, especially in the first part of the lecture, and we'll uh, stick for this lecture to binary classification. So we'll stick to classification settings where we have two classes, red and blue. We'll call um, one the uh, positive class, the blue one, and we'll call one the negative class, and we'll say that the uh, classifier is a detector for the positive class. So you can think of this as like um, detecting a disease. Uh, in those cases, people say that you are positive for the disease or negative for the disease. That's the sort of classification that we're doing. Uh, and we've seen two basic ideas of how, uh, uh, basic metrics for how good a classifier is uh, already, or one already, basically the number of misclassifications, we've talked about that. Uh, so the proportion of misclassifications in the data set that you're looking at, we will call the error. And the opposite of that, the proportion of uh, things you got right, that's called the accuracy. So these are the two basic starting points for our uh, metrics with which we evaluate a machine learning model. Of course, we never usually train just one model. Usually we train a bunch of them, and we want to compare them. We want to see which one is best. You do that either because you have different algorithms. So we saw three of them in the introductory, le introductory lecture. There's a linear classifier, a uh, k-nearest neighbor classifier, and the uh, decision tree classifier. So if you train all three, you might want to see, well, which one does best. But also within one, let's call it a one model class, like the k-nearest neighbor, there are different choices you can make. So for instance, k-nearest neighbors has this k, how many neighbors do you look at to determine what your class is, you have to pick the value of k. There's no, nobody who tells you what the best value of k is, it depends on your data, so given your data you have to choose the value of k. So you might pick three values here, k3, k9, and k27. 
and just see which one does best. So you want, so you even though you're only doing k-nearest neighbor classification, you're still getting three models that you want to compare. So lots of models, which one does the best? The very basic experiment is very simple. You train your classifier, let's say you're doing two of them. You train two classifiers, A and B. You compute the error of A and you compute the error of B. And the lower the error, the better. That's sort of the basic principle of all uh, experimentation. But there's a couple of gaps here that we need to fill in. First, on which data do we compute the error? We've talked about this a little bit already. <coughs> How do we eliminate random effects? I'll show you an example of that later. And is error the best metric to use? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. The one thing we've already seen is that if we look at how well a uh, classifier or a regression model covers the set it's trained on, that's not always a good, or that's very rarely a good indicator of how good the model is doing. So we see here clear examples of overfitting by the regression, uh, the decision tree classifier and the regression tree. Um, so we say the most important role in machine learning is never evaluate your model performance, never judge how good your model is doing on the training data, because it might be overfitting. So I've shown you this, this already. The thing to do is to withhold some data, and we call this your test data. So you hold back some data, you train on the rest, that's called your training data, and then after you're done training, you can see how good your model does on the test data, on the data it hasn't seen before, and hopefully, uh, that will give you a good indication of how good the model is and how likely the model is to perform well on future data. Um, a little bit more detail about this. How should you split your data? It's not important what the proportion is that you use. So it's, there's no rule that says like 20% test data, 80% training data. The important thing is how big your test data is, how many absolute number, uh, the absolute number of instances in your test data. So ideally you want 10,000 of them. That's not always realistic. Uh, you don't want fewer than 500 of them. And we'll see in the uh, second half exactly why that is. For now, just keep this in mind. 10,000 is ideal. You might not have 10,000 examples at all in your data. You might want some left over to train on. So in that case, you can go lower, but never go below 500 if you can avoid it. So that solves the basic problem of overfitting, but it doesn't solve it entirely. And to see why, let's look at the uh, k-nearest neighbor classifier. Basically, the, there, uh, there's a problem that crops up if we're testing lots and lots and lots of models. So let's look at this k-value for the um, k-nearest neighbor classifier that we have to set, which is set to 7 here. So just to remind you the k-nearest neighbor classifier, what it does, if it sees a new point, which is supposed to classify, it looks in the data, the training data that it's already seen, it just remembers all the training data, it looks at the k nearest points, in this case the seven nearest points, and then classifies the new point by the class that is most prevalent in that group of seven. This incidentally is why k is usually an odd number, because then you don't have any ties. Um, so let's see what happens if we try and fit a model, if we try and, uh, sorry, if we try and pick this k using lots and lots of tests, lots and lots of experiments. And we'll do this on the data we saw, we used in the uh, introductory lecture, but we'll subsample it. So we'll create a much smaller data set because that will exaggerate the effects and hopefully give you a clear idea of what I'm talking about. So this is our data. We subsample a bunch of points. It's still uh, US soldiers. We measure their height, the distance between the shoulder blades, and we try and predict the gender. So we uh, start with train one classifier, with k is one, I think, small letters. And we get some classifier out of it and some, uh, let's see, I think we're, yeah, we're starting with k1. And we get some error value, some proportion of misclassification uh, on the test set. We do k is two and k all the way up to k is 25. We just try all of them, and for all of them we look at the proportions of proportion of misclassified examples on the test set. So playing nice, we've withheld the test set, so we're not subject to overfitting, 
So let's see which one does best. It's this one. It has an error of 0 0.08. It's difficult to see here, but it's k equals 23. And it has 0 0.08. Uh, there it is. 0 0.08 error. So the idea of this experiment and the whole idea of a test set, having a test set. Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so there's a point here, so that's a plotting error. I think it's it's in the middle of the point, so I think it's just about in the blue area. I'm not sure how it classifies it. Okay. You can count it up and figure out what's 0 0.08. Uh, probably, but we're not sure. I mean, there are blue points that are misclassified. So uh, 0 0.08 of these points should be misclassified. So if that's one of them, then it's a red point, but it looks like blue is in the middle. Anyway, that's not not the important point. The important point here is that because we've withheld this test set, set we expect two things, that this k value uh, really gives us the best model, that k is 23 for this data set is the best model. And furthermore, that if we look at this model on some new test data, if we sample some new data from the same source, we get the same error on that data, or roughly the same error. Normally, we can't do that. Normally, by this point, we've used up all our data. We've used our training data. We've used our test data. But in this case, we subsampled so we can actually do a run on some new data. We can do the same thing again on a new data set. So we sample because we had we subsampled this much bigger data set, right? So we subsample some new new data from the original data set, and we run the whole thing again. And this time, there it is. Case five gives us the best model. Again with an error of 0 0.08. And k is 23 gives us 0 0.16. So this is our best model now, k is 5. Note that the decision boundary looks completely different. And if we compare it to the other one, this is the, uh, these are the differences. So in some sense, we thought we had a good model, and we thought we had a nice value of k picked out. But it turns out that all we're doing again is modeling random fluctuations. We're not modeling the pattern in the data. We're not giving something that generalizes to the data we haven't seen yet, the data we might see in the future. We're just modeling random fluctuations in the training data. This is a, a specific instance of the general statistical problem of multiple testing. If you've done a statistics course, you'll know about this. Uh, this is an XKCD comic, which uh, illustrates it nicely. So here are two scientists looking for a link between jelly beans and acne. And they test all the colors, and then for one of them, they find a significant uh, effect. And that's not because they, there is a significant effect, but because they've tried 20 times, and these things are slightly random. In fact, this p uh, equals uh, 0 0.05 value that we normally use, that means that the probability of observing, a re uh, observing an effect when there isn't one is 1 in 20. So if you 20, do 20 of these experiments, you will at one point observe an effect. And the same thing is happening here. We are doing so many experiments that the effect that we're observing is due to randomness and not due to something that generalizes to new data. Or at least we cannot exclude, we cannot tell the difference anymore because we've done so many experiments. So to avoid this, there's a couple of different things you can do. This is the way it's usually done and the simplest way. So this is the way I advise you to do it. Uh, obviously, you start again with splitting your data into tests and training, as we've done. And then you choose your model and your hyperparameters only using the training set. We'll look at how to do that later. Then you state a hypothesis. For instance, this is the best model. This is the model that I want to test. This uh, I get this performance using this model, that sort of thing. And once you state your hypothesis, you, t you test that hypothesis once on the test data. So the whole problem is the more, the more you use the test data, the less, it's, the less valuable it is, the more of these random effects you get. So basically, we make the rule we only look at our test data once. We figure out how long our machine learning project is going to be, when we're going to write our results paper, our report, whatever. That's when we're going to use our test data, and before that, we're never going to look at it. So the important thing here is that you need to make this split 
at the start of your project, put the test data away, and then have a look at it again until the end of the project. And quite often with students, I've sort of had this, ask this question at the end of the project, have you split some test data? And they say no. And then it's sort of too late. That's like asking the barber to make your hair a little longer. By that point, you've already looked at your test data and the damage is done and cannot be undone. So make sure to do this at the beginning of your project. That's why I'm telling you now, because you are at the beginning of your project. Make sure you have a test set and make sure you put it away and never look at it for the next uh, seven weeks. So then we're left with the training set and using this training set, we have to, uh, oh, sorry, one more shouty slide just to hammer this point home. This is very important. So now we have this training set. We're not allowed to look at our test data, but we have to use the training set to, um, I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. Don't reuse your test data. One more point of emphasis for these two reasons. If you reuse your test data, it causes you to pick the wrong model and it inflates your estimate of the performance. So what do you do with this training data? How do you use the training data to pick your best model without looking at your uh, test data? Yes, a question over there. Uh, question is, could you do bootstrapping? That's getting way ahead of, way ahead of us, uh, of ourselves. Bootstrapping is in the second half. We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll do, we're doing something similar, which is called a uh, training validation test split. So basically you take your training data and you split it again. And you do the same thing you already did. So during your uh, model selection, during your hyperparameter selection, you train on your new training data, your new even smaller training data, you evaluate on your validation data, you pick all your hyperparameters, your value of k, the shape of your network, uh, that sort of stuff. And then you're done and then you say, okay, this is my result, this is what I'm going to publish or put into production or uh, give to my boss as a result of the project. Then you combine your training and validation into the original test data and you test once on the test data set. Uh, sorry, uh, combine training and validation into the original training data and you test once on the original test set. So here's an example of what it looks like when people get this wrong. It's important to be able to recognize because people get this wrong a lot, surprisingly. So you will quite often see this in proper published peer-reviewed literature. Somebody presenting a method, which they call hours with some hyperparameter, so like this k in k nearest neighbors, and they're comparing to other methods, which is at least something. They are comparing to other methods. They say, well, this is how these methods do, this is their error on three different data sets, and these are our errors for different values of k. The problem here is that they've tested all values of k on one test set, and then they start highlighting their best performances. And say, look, we do the best on all three data sets, if you ignore the values of all the other hyperparameters. So this is not how to do it, because now you're committing multiple testing. Uh, what you should do instead is this. You report the other methods in the same way. You pick a hyperparameter using this validation set. Report it if you like. It's not always reported, but it's usually nice to report which one you ended up with. And then you, uh, using that hyperparameter, which you picked using the validation set, you report your test set results. And they're different now because you get rid of these random fluctuations, so they're a bit worse. Uh, and these are fictional examples, but I figured, you know, they still do, let's say they still do the best on two of them and not on one of them. What you see is that the k values are very different. You have to report that this is how you did it, even though in an ideal world everybody does this, you still have to say that you do it so that people know that, you, that this is what you did. And the main reason is here, if you do this, there are three things that go wrong, three suggestions that you create that are not true. So I wrote them down in my notes. First, that this, uh, the model presented here is better than all the other, better than the other models on all data sets, which is not true because there's these random fluctuations. 
that if you want to run the model on data set one, you should use KS3, which is not true because this might be due to random fluctuations again. And that if your data set is a bit like data set one, you can expect an error of 0 0.08. So these are the sort of conclusions you want to draw from this paper, and you can't because of these random fluctuations. And here you can draw these conclusions. You can conclude it's better in all cases, but at least in a couple of the data sets, it's pretty good, at least competitive or better. Uh, you can conclude that if your data set is similar to data set one, you should use k equals three. And then yet you can expect an error of 0 0.11. So after all this splitting your data set up into smaller and smaller chunks, you may be left with quite a small training data set. So if you have that, you might want to use something called cross-validation, where you basically do the same thing. You split your training data into a training and validation, but you do it a number of times. And every time a different slice of your training data becomes a validation data. These are called folds, so this is five-fold cross-validation. Uh, and you do a training run and a validation run on every one of them, and then you average the results to give you an average result, which gives you a little bit more accuracy, uh, sorry, that's the wrong word to use, which gives you a little bit more of a precise number for the performance, because even though you're using a validation train split, every instance in your training set is still being used once to train and once to validate. So you're sort of making more efficient use of your training data in this way. The price you're paying is that you have to train and validate five times. So you have to wait a little bit longer to get the results. <coughs> you can also do uh, cross-validation in the testing phase, but that's a bit messier, so I don't recommend doing that. Sometimes your data has some unusual properties. For instance, if the instances are ordered in time, like stock market prices, for instance, then you want to maintain that time ordering when you make your test and training split. Because if you don't do that, if you <clears throat> sample your test set randomly from, uh, from the uh, different instances throughout time, then you might be training on instances that are in the future. Sorry, you might be testing. No, you might be training on instances that are in the future compared to the ones that are in the test set. Um, so you, it's, it's a bit like your model is getting information from the future, which you can do in this case because you have all the data. But then when you put your model into production, obviously your model is not going to get information from the future. Uh, so you might notice a very big performance drop. So in that case, you want to keep your data time ordered when you make your uh, test training split. And if you're doing cross-validation, you might want to do something called walk-forward cross-validation, where you... Uh, do these sort of slices, these folds again, but you only train on the data that comes before the data that you validate on. Which gives you less training data, but this data realistically is not available during training, so you shouldn't use it. Uh, it's not always necessary, so if you were, for instance, doing stamp classification, emails do have a timestamp, emails come ordered in time, but seeing an email from the future doesn't usually give you a... Um, unless you have a very fancy model, it doesn't usually give you a, a benefit in classification. So there it's fine to just shuffle the data set around. Basically, if your data set has some odd properties, make sure to think a little bit about your validation um, protocol, whether it's actually a realistic simulation of what you expect to see in production, how you expect to use the model in production. So that's all about validation. That's the important part of the lecture. So now let's talk about when you're doing these experiments. Which models do you pick? Which models do you try out? There's a big space usually. Uh, if you have a couple of hyperparameters, and you can try all possible values of all possible hyperparameters. So it's a big space of stuff to try. <clears throat> so how do you? Where do you start? Which ones do you pick? It's mostly up to you. Uh, so you can use your intuition and a little bit of trial and error. 
So long as you only look at this validation set, you can just test the model, see how it does, tinker with it a little bit, see how it does again, tinker with it a bit, a bit again, and keep improving your model and improving your model. Because at the end of the project, you know you have this test set to do a proper test run with. Uh, so this is probably the most common approach, and it's perfectly fine for you to use this in your projects. If you get overwhelmed by this massive hyperparameter space, or you want a slightly more um, systematic approach, you can just do what is called grid search. So basically, for all your hyperparameters, you pick a range of values that you're going to try, and you just try all combinations exhaustively. It's called grid search because if you imagine having two hyperparameters with a bunch of values that you're trying, and here's your other hyperparameter, then all the values you're trying form a grid like this. So that's possible. It uh, takes a long time if you have a lot of hyperparameters and values. Uh, you can also, I haven't put it on the slide, but you can also optimize, just pick some random value, optimize one hyperparameter, and then in one direction, and then once you find the optimum, optimize another hyperparameter in another direction, and then sort of move by dimension bit by bit. That's quite common. Uh, in fact, when we do trial and error, we sort of usually focus on one hyperparameter at the time. And if you really want to go fancy, you can look back to the previous lecture where we did stuff like random search, which actually does apply to this search problem as well. So you can just pick a random value, jump to a nearby neighbor, see if they're better. If they're better, you pick the near nearby neighbor, and you keep iterating that until you find a good model. So lots of options, but like I say, basically trial and error is fine. One point to note about grid search, which is illustrated very well by this uh, diagram, is that actually sampling randomly usually uh, might do better. So if you have one unimportant parameter and one important parameter, and you do this three by three grid search, you're getting only nine samples, sorry, you're getting only three samples for the important parameter, even though you took nine samples. And if you do it randomly, all nine samples will try different values of the important parameter. Uh, and randomly sampling in this grid is a good way to ensure that uh, things don't overlap like this, giving you less information. So grid search is not always the best option. So then, you've picked your hyperparameters, you have a model that you're happy with, you get some error, and you enthusiastically report, this is my error value. I have 5% error, 0 0.05. I misclassify only 5% of my examples. Is that good? Or is it bad? Or is it, does it depend? Well, if you can guess, it depends. So there's one discussion that, uh, that's a good illustration of this, which is whether uh, women over 50 in the Netherlands should be screened for breast cancer. Uh, currently, I think this is still the policy. So if you're uh, a woman over 50, you will get a, a letter in the mail telling you to get a breast cancer screening. And there are a lot of people sort of arguing that this is not necessarily saving lives. It might actually not be beneficial. Uh, because of two problems. So let's go back to the 0 0.05 error. Let's say we have a breast cancer screening machine. We have a classifier for breast cancer. So instances or patients, classification is positive or negative. So it has cancer, it doesn't have cancer. In that case, 0 0.05 is not a good result. It sounds impressive. But actually, the incidence of breast cancer under in the uh, patient group here is one percent. So if I just say that every that nobody has cancer, I get zero. Po I get zero point zero one. So I do better than this fancy classifier that you've trained. So the first thing I'd like you to think whenever you see a headline like this, it's always an AI these days, not a like a statistical model or linear regression. It's always AI. This AI judge correctly predicts court case results 80% of the time. So the first thing I want you to think, the first question I want you to have is, what was the class balance? 
because if 80% of them are acquittals and 20% of them are uh, convictions, then I can get 80% accuracy by just saying they're all acquittals. In this case, it was actually a 50-50 split. So fair enough, this is relatively impressive. Or at least it's worth noting. Um, so back to this 0 0.05 value. Is it good? Is it bad? There are two things to take into account when judging, uh, judging your accuracy. One is the class imbalance, which we've already seen. So if the classes are very unbalanced, then high accuracy is very easy to get. The other is cost imbalance. And we see this in the breast cancer example. Misclass different misclassifications have different values. So missing somebody who has cancer is very costly. Whereas missing, whether, whereas um, predicting that somebody has cancer when they don't is less costly, but also costs something. Because they will be taken for a biopsy, they will uh, experience a lot of stress. Um, so that can also be costly. So it depends on which misclassification is more likely, uh, how good your classifier is doing. So there's class imbalance and cost imbalance. So these two are uh, important in judging how uh, informative a particular, uh, in, in how good a particular accuracy is and how informative accuracy is as a value at all. Uh, yeah, so this is what a class imbalance data set looks like. Um, one good thing to do to sort of guard you against these problems is to include in your baselines, in the models that you compare against, a majority class baseline, which does what I just said. It just picks the, the largest class and always predicts that. That's not an interesting machine learning model. It doesn't actually look at the data. It just looks at the class distribution. But it tells you it gives you a sort of benchmark for these um, accuracy values, where your accuracy, accuracy starts becoming interesting. So only if the, uh, or the error, sorry, if the error is lower than whatever the majority class classifier gets, that's where it starts becoming interesting. So only the values between 0 0.05 and 0 are actually interesting. Another problem of class imbalance is this. If you have imbalanced classes and you split your data set in such a way that the class proportion is the same, which is a good thing to do. It's called stratified sampling. Uh, what you see is that even though you have a thousand instances in your data set, in your test set, you only get a tiny amount of uh, blue classes, uh, blue classed instances in your test set. And really this is what the whole thing is about, is getting these right. So even though you have what looks like quite a nice test set, you're really only judging your classifier on how well it does on these ones, and there's not a lot of them. So you're not getting very accurate readings on your error here. Uh, so if you have large class imbalance, you need a bigger test set. So be careful. We'll talk about how to deal with this sort of thing uh, a little bit more in the next lecture. Some more examples of Cost imbalance, so spam is another one, spam classification. If you accidentally put a real email in your spam box, that's very costly. If you accidentally put a spam email in the inbox, that's less costly. So you need to take these two things into account. And the general message here is that uh, basically in these situations where you have high cost imbalance or high class imbalance, accuracy is not your best metric to use because you only get this very small range of accuracies that are actually interesting between 0.05 of 95% uh, and 100% when we're talking about accuracy. You only have a very few, a very small amount of, of your test set that you're actually interested that actually makes a difference there. So it can be helpful in this case to look at different, um, nope, sorry, different metrics, different things you can measure on your test set. Given a classifier, you run it on your test set, and you can measure different things to help you in these situations where you have class imbalance and cost imbalance. And we'll look at these ones. So we'll look first at the confusion matrix and the precision recall, the true positive rate, the false positive rate, some plots, and the finally the area under, under the curve. And that's hopefully where we hopefully we manage all that before the break. Let's see. So the confusion matrix is very simple. You just 
make a big table, a small table with the actual predictions horizontally and the predicted, sorry, the actual values, the actual classes horizontally and the predictions vertically, and you just tabulate. So in this case, uh, six of the things we pre predicted as positive were actually positive, and two of them we got wrong and they were actually negative. So this sort of speaks for itself. The margins of the confusion matrix give you the actual positives and the actual negatives, and the number of predicted positives and the number of predicted negatives, which uh, can show you in, a, uh, in an instant whether you have class imbalance. So what we have here is a data set horizontally with serious class imbalance. So there are 385, uh, 50, 85, 385 positives and only 50 negatives. So a very imbalanced data set. And what you can see is that the model has decided to just call everything positive. So that's the sort of situation that we've talked about, uh, we talked about earlier. And starting with this confusion matrix, there are some uh, values that you can uh, compute from the confusion matrix. I rearranged my slides, so these ones are missing from the slide, but if you want the accuracy, you just sum up the di diagonal and divide it by the total over the whole matrix. If you want the error, you sum up the anti-diagonal and also divide by the whole thing. So let's look at some of these more interesting uh, metrics. First up, the precision and the recall. So this is how you compute them. For the precision, you take the number of true positives and you divide it by the number of predicted positives. For the recall, you take the number of true positives and you divide it by the actual number of positives. Now, I always get confused about this. I always have to look up which is which and what they mean again. So I usually turn to this very helpful picture from Wikipedia. So if you think of your, posit your classifier as selecting a number of elements from your data set, specifically selecting those elements which are positive, then some of them will actually be positive, the ones we got right. That's this uh, green semicircle, and some of them we will get wrong. Those are the false positives. So the precision is how many of the selected items are relevant, so the proportion of things we selected that are correct. Obviously, the higher the better. And the recall is how many of the total number of uh, positives did we find. Uh, and that's its proportion. So that's precision and recall. Obviously, we want both of them to be as high as possible. Uh, but we don't know how to balance them. That's something that depends on the domain, on the use case. Uh, if we have to choose two classifiers, whether precision or recall is more important to us. So what we can do when we have two objectives that we want to balance is just plot both of them in a scatter plot. So here we plot the precision vertically and the recall horizontally. And these five points are uh, classifiers that we might encounter. We test, they each get a precision, each get a recall, so we plot this. Uh, the orange points are ones that we can pretty much guarantee. So we can guarantee 100% uh, recall, 1.0 recall, if we just call everything positive. If we just call the whole square positive, then obviously we know that we find all the positives. We also have all the possible false positives that we can have. So it's not very good, but we can guarantee very simply to get a 100% recall. We can also almost guarantee 100% precision by finding only the one point that we are most certain about that it's a true positive. Uh, that is a, yeah, we are most certain about that it's positive and selecting only that one. So if this whole circle becomes only one point, so that's sort of the one point in our data set that we're most certain about, if we select only that one, then if we're right about that one, we get 100% precision because this proportion becomes one. If we select nothing, then we get zero over zero, so this is undefined. So this is basically, technically for precision, the best we can do. So those are not very interesting models, is all I'm saying. The models that are interesting are somewhere in between, and they strike some balance between precision and recall. And we don't know exactly what balance to strike, but what we can say is that this blue 
model here is always worse than either this model or this model, than either one of the green models, because the blue model does worse in both precision and recall. So the models we're interested in form a sort of uh, what's called a Pareto front along this line here. Uh, we don't know which of the green models we prefer without looking at our class imbalance and cost imbalance, uh, but at least we can rule out this blue point. So that's precision and recall. There's another pair like that, the true positive rate and the false positive rate, which are calculated like this. That's the accuracy. You can tell that I rearranged the slides at the last minute. So the true positive rate is true po the proportion of actual positives that we found. So how many of the actual positives did we get? And the false positive rate is of the actual negatives, what proportion of them did we misclassify as negatives? So that's a bit confusing when you look at it like this, and hopefully we can make that a little bit clearer. But for now, uh, we can just plot them, same as we did with the precision and recall. Uh, in this case, we want the false positive rate to be as low as possible, and the true positive rate to be as high as possible. So the optimal corner is here in the top left instead of the top right. Uh, but otherwise, it works the same. So the orange dots are one classifiers we know we can make easily, but they're also not very useful classifiers. And the good classifiers that we're interested in are somewhere here in the middle. This is called an ROC space, uh, which stands for Receiver Operating Characteristic. There's just a historical artifact. It doesn't have any real meaning. Um, so all of these things are interesting if we have a bunch of classifiers that we want to choose between. But actually, the way they're most usually used is on a single classifier, which we can tune. Because we have a sort of um, trade-off here between true positive rate and false positive rate, or between precision and recall. So the ideal thing is to train one classifier and to see if we can tune it to set that trade-off. Right? So imagine that you have one classifier and it has this little dial that tells it how likely it is to call something positive. Then if we set it all the way to be very timid, to never call anything positive, to call everything negative, then the true positive rate, of course, would be zero. But the false positive rate is also zero, because we never misclassify anything either as positive. We just never call anything positive, so we're always here in the uh, bottom left corner. Then if we give it a little bit more, we turn the dial a little bit more, and we make it a little bit more eager to call things positive, then it's going to call some things positive, but only the ones that it's absolutely sure about. So it's still very timid, but for some of them it will be absolutely sure. And what we can see is that in the first few steps, it actually gets all of them right. So the true positive rate goes up a little bit, and they're all correct, so our false positive rate doesn't increase. If we turn the dial even more, we make it even more eager to call things positive, it's going to get some things wrong. And the false positive rate is going to go up. So here we see that we've added a couple more true positives, but we've also added some false, uh, false positives. And as we turn the dial on and on and on, it gets more and more confident in calling things positive until by the end it calls everything positive, gets a 100% true positive rate, but also gets loads and loads of stuff wrong, gets the whole data set wrong, basically. And basically the point here is that we trace out a sort of a curve that tells us for this classifier with the dial, independent of how the dial, how we set the dial, how good this classifier is. Because we don't know how to set the dial, but how to set the dial depends on our use case. But how far this curve pushes into the top right, uh, top left corner tells us how good the classifier is. Uh, what do you mean by every time? Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, do we get the same results every time if we keep the dial on the same thing? That sort of depends on the setting. Um, we'll clarify exactly how this works later. You'll, you'll see, uh, hopefully that will answer your question. Um, 
because the question is how do we build this classifier with a dial? How do we do this? Because right now we can only build single classifiers that give us single classifications. And the idea is to build a ranking classifier. A classifier that doesn't just say, I think this is blue or this is red, this is positive or this is negative, but a classifier that actually takes a data set, training or test set or validation set, and ranks all the instances from most negative to most positive. And it depends on your classifier how you do this. Here's the example for a linear classifier. You basically take your classification boundary and you compute the distance from the, class, uh, from the decision boundary to the instance. And the further you are into the red area, the more red, the more negative you call the uh, instance. So as you can see, A is furthest away from the decision boundary, so A is the most negative. Uh, the more, uh, yeah, so the further you are from the decision boundary, the more negative or the more positive your uh, point becomes. Here you see why it's the most positive, because it is the furthest into the blue from the decision boundary. So that gives us a ranking. And now we can take this threshold and simply choose this one here, and simply choose where to put it along this line. And the further we put it to the positive side, the fewer things it's going to classify as positive. So if we put it all the way to the left, we get this very timid classifier. And the further we push it, sorry, all the way to the right, we get this very timid classifier. And the further we push it to the left, the more eager it becomes to call things positive. We can measure how well a ranking classifier does by computing the number of ranking errors it makes. This is a very important slide because this is a very common mistake on the exam. Uh, let me go back one and uh, one slide, set this up properly. So we cannot tell how good this ranking is because we are not given a ranking on the data set. We are only given a true classification on the data set. So we cannot tell for the whole ranking whether every point is the right way around, but we can tell for some pairs whether they're the, they're the right way around which is for every blue and red pair, every pair of a blue and red instance, we know whether they are ranked the right way around or the wrong way around. So here we see Y is to the right of G, which is the right way around, because Y is ranked as more positive than G, even though G is actually, we do get a classification error on G, there's not a ranking error, because they are ranked the right way around. We get a ranking error when a red point is ranked to the right so, uh, yeah, to the right of a blue point. When a negative point is ranked as more positive than a positive point. That's called a ranking error. The important thing is ranking error, you get one potential ranking error for every pair of two points in your distance of different, uh, in your uh, data set of different colors. So you can make a lot of, potentially make a lot of ranking errors. You can visualize this in what's called a coverage matrix. So if you put all the blue points on the uh, vertical axis and all the red points on the horizontal axis, then you get a, a every cell in this matrix is a potential ranking error, is a pair of points that you can rank the wrong way around. And you can color them green if they're not a ranking error and blue if you, they are a ranking error. And what you get is this kind of, uh, uh, if you arrange them, properly, so if you arrange them by the ranking that the class classifier gives you, you get this green area in the bottom right and this red area in the top left, which as it happens is exactly your ROC space. Because your true positive rate, and remember we rank these instances in the order the classifier gave us, in the order the classifier is most certain about, so if we have a very timid classifier then Y is the instance it's first going to give, tell us is positive. It's going to start here when it uh, chooses things to be positive. So if you rescale this, uh, this ROC space, we basically get the coverage matrix. And we see that if we have a very timid classifier, we start here. It just doesn't call anything positive. And if we allow it to call some things positive, then it's going to call Y positive a little bit more, so these are all good, and then at some point here, uh, it makes one mistake, which is G, so here you can see it's made 
one false positive, but uh, it's, a it's a small price to pay for lots of uh, true positives. And as we move to the left along this ranking, it traces out this lovely curve. So the coverage matrix and the ROC space are sort of basically one and the same thing. So a warning, which if I'd been nice, I would have put at the beginning, but I put afterwards. The thing you just saw was one of the exam questions. So I sent you this message this morning about the uh, practice exam, which has a list of, of things you have to practice. This is one of them. So if you didn't get that, remember to review the slides and maybe ask. If you have any questions, ask them on the discussion board. Um, <clears throat> we're a little late for the break, but we've only a couple of slides left, slides left to finish this part. Uh, within this ROC space and this um, position recall space, if you draw a line between two points, you can achieve any point on that line by just randomly selecting. Uh, if you randomly select the top classifier, the bottom classifier with 50% chance each, you get right in the middle. If you change the percentages, you get anywhere on this line, which basically means that this area under this curve is the range of possible classifiers that we know we can achieve. Because these dots are classifiers we know we have, and any anything on a line between them we know we can achieve by randomly picking, randomly mixing the two. So that's sort of similar to the uh, proportion of green cells in the coverage matrix. And this area under the curve is a good measure of how well your classifier, how well your ranking classifier does, independent of how you set this dial, independent of how eager it is to call things positive. Now, like I said, how you make a classifier that's a given classifier, how you turn it into a ranking classifier, depends on the classifier. So very quickly, here's how to do it for a decision tree. So we saw the decision tree earlier. Uh, what you see is that it uh, cuts the uh, feature space into segments. So all the leaves of the decision tree corresponds to one of these four segments. And all uh, points within one of these segments are classified in the same way. So this segment is always classified as red, and this segment is always classified as blue, which means that when we rank these points, we cannot distinguish between things within the segments, but we can look at the segment and see how uh, blue is this segment. Of all the things that end up in our training set, of all the things that end up here, how blue are they? So this is a very blue segment, so we rank this uh, top right is a very blue segment, so we rank it as more positive than the uh, top left segment, which is 50-50. And so we cannot distinguish between many of the instances, but we can rank by segment. So you get this kind of ranking where all these V, X, U, G, and Y are ranked equally, but they are ranked as more positive than S and Z. Which means that when we draw the coverage matrix, some of the pairs will be um, ranked equally. So G and Y, for instance, uh, as we saw, Y should be more positive than G, but they're actually ranked equally, so we count that as half an error, half a ranking error, uh, and we color it orange. So remember the confusion matrix and all metrics derived from the confusion matrix are metrics on a single classifier, whereas the AUC, the area under this curve, is a metric derived on a... Um, range of class classifiers or on a ranking classifier. That's important to uh, remember. Uh, so we talked a lot about these ROC curves and not as much about these position recall curves. There's a lot of disagreement about which uh, is actually better. And if you want disagreement, you go to Twitter. So here's a good picture of Twitter where you see that in this case, at least, uh, the uh, precision recall curves on the right are much more informative because they're much more spread out. And the ROC curves are sort of all in the top left corner and don't really tell you anything. It's not a lot of effort to just plot both for your problem and see which one uh, gives you the most information. So let's recap. Remember, right now, if you start your project, split your data into a train validation and a test set. 
don't look at the test set until the end of the project. Accuracy is great. Don't worry about anything but accuracy unless you have cost imbalance or class imbalance. And then you have to start looking at things like a confusion matrix, position recall space, or ROC space, uh, which are very informative, but are not a single number to choose one or the other. So if you want a single number out of this position recall or out of this ROC space, try the area under the curve either on the position recall or the ROC. That finally brings us to the break. Apologies for running late a little bit. Let's take 15 minutes and talk about regression. All right. <clears throat> so I've talked a lot about how to experiment with classifiers and how to test classifiers and how to compare classifiers. Now let's talk about uh, what to do with regression. Uh, regression is a bit simpler, but there are some subtleties there as well. So there are a lot of different uh, loss functions you can use for regression, but for now we'll just stick with the one we've seen, we've seen the one we know, the mean squared error. Um, so this formula hopefully looks familiar to you now. Uh, one thing you, want, you might want to do when you report your error, so when you have your model and you uh, report how well it does, uh, is put a, a square over it, square root over it, sorry. Uh, and basically all that does is brings the units back to your original unit. So if you're, for instance, predicting how tall somebody is, then the output of your model is a value in centimeters. The target output is also a value in centimeters. So the error is also a value in centimeters, how many centimeters you're off. But then the sum is suddenly a value in square centimeters. So it's like a surface area, which is unusual and doesn't really yield interpretation. So if you take a square of that again, then you're uh, sum over all these is, again, a value in centimeters rather than square centimeters. So this is sort of slightly more interpretable as an error value. Uh, and it doesn't change the optimization. So if you're optimizing, you might as well leave the square out because the optimum is in the same place. But when you're reporting, it helps to put this square on there. Uh, so when we look at the... Um, the error, or the, the, the mean squared, let's say the mean squared error, but this sort of roughly holds for any numeric uh, output, any regression uh, performance. Uh, we can analyze it and we can decompose it, the value that we get, into a bias and a variance. Uh, bias here is different from the bias in a classifier, so there's also a parameter in our linear classifier and linear regression which we also call bias. That happens occasionally in machine learning. We get these overloaded terms. This means something different. So don't confuse them, even though I've given them the same color. Um, so here I've drawn a little line. So the optimal thing, uh, the optimal value, the optimal mean squared error value that we want, ideally, of obviously, is zero. It's the best we can possibly do. But that might not be possible if there's some noise in our data and if we're restricted to a particular model class, then even mean squared error of zero might never be achievable. So there's also an optimal mean squared error, which is sort of the optimum any model in our model class can get. And this is on the test data, remember, so an overfitting model is not necessarily going to hit the optimum or hit zero. And then we train a regression model, and we measure how well it does in our test set or our validation set, and we get some mean squared error that we've measured. Or root mean squared error, but let's stick with mean squared error for now. We measure that. Uh, but that's the measurement, which can change. If we do the whole thing again, then uh, we might sample some new data from the same source. This value is going to change slightly. If we're using something like gradient descent, uh, what we get is also dependent on our initialization value. So there might be some randomness in our learning algorithm if it's complicated. And that all means that if we repeat the whole experiment, including data gathering and including training the regression model, we might get different mean squared error values. Some better and some worse. So if we look at this distribution, we can decompose this, uh, the value we get into two uh, components. One is the bias, which is the distance from the mean, the true mean, which we don't know, 
because we can only do one experiment, but if we did lots and lots of experiments, we would converge to this value, which is the true mean. So the distance from the true mean to the optimum is called the bias, which is how bad our process is doing independent of all this variance caused by the randomness. Yes, I forgot what MSE stands for. Oh, uh, good question in that case. Uh, MSE stands for mean squared error. So if you have a model, which is the red line here, which is trying to fit these points, then what we do is we uh, take the difference between what the model predicts and what, the, what we know the true value to be. We square all those differences, and then we sum them up. Right. And the sum of all those ones, that's called the mean squared error, that's uh, what we want to get as small as possible mean squared error, so how well it's doing. So it's sort of the equivalent of the error in classification. It's a value that we want to minimize. <coughs> and so dependent on uh, different runs of our experiments, gathering the data, we get different mean squared error values. And there's a sort of uh, hypothetical true mean squared error that we cannot measure, but we can approximate by measuring. And the diff distance from that to the optimum is the bias. So if we forget about all this variance, how well is our uh, approach doing? And then the variance is the spread of our ex different experiments, hypothetical different experiments, around this true mean squared error. And then there's a little distance to zero, which is the irreducible error, the error we cannot get rid of. So if we have uh, both low, low bias, low variance, then we get a lot of points that are very close to the optimum, so then we're just happy. If we get low bias but high variance, we might get points that are very low, even less than the optimum, because through random fluctuation we might get lower than the optimum. But again, this is not a cause for happiness, because if we sample some new data, we will be higher than the optimum again. Um, so this is a low bias, high variance situation, and this is a high bias, low variance situation. Here's a common picture, common way of visualizing it as a dartboard. So if you get both low, then all your darts are exactly in the middle. And the higher your bias, the further away from the middle your average is, and the higher your variance, the more spread out the points are. And the important thing to remember when analyzing this picture, when looking at this picture, is that we only get one dart. So this is what it looks like if we had multiple darts, but we only get one of them, and from one dart you cannot tell, uh, you can tell how far you are from the middle, but you cannot work out whether it's due to high bias or high variance. That's a question? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. So can you, uh, yeah, so if you have this high bias and you basically know the, if you know somehow the value of your bias, is there some way you can move these points closer to the bias, by basically translate these points downwards in this case? Um, I think the important thing to remember here is that these points are not your data points, right? These points are results that you get. Uh, and it's not a necessarily dartboard, so it's a one-dimensional line. So basically the only way to move these points to the left, to the optimal point, is to make your model better, to give it a better fit. Which is, yeah, that's the whole difficulty of what we're doing, basically. Um, so some examples to maybe visualize this a little bit more clearly. Here's a typical case of high bias. If we have a nonlinear relation and a uh, so a sort of curve here in the data, and we try to fit a linear model to that, basically our model doesn't have the capacity, it's not rich enough, it's not flexible enough to fit this shape of data. And then we get a high bias because uh, whatever we do, we will always get this line, basically. There's no variance, we don't get a lot of variation, we will always get the same line. 
but the line is just wrong. So that's a high bias situation, sometimes called underfitting. High variance situations might seem preferable, but actually are uh, can be just as tricky. Uh, they occur when your model has a high capacity, so when it's very basically it has a big memory and it can potentially memorize all the data, like a regression tree. So you get this overfitting situation where it overfits all the data. And what you see is that the bias can be very low, but the variance is high because if you resample the data, you get very different results suddenly. So high, high variance tends to uh, correspond to overfitting, low variance, but high bias tends to get correspond to underfitting. Um, so if you notice this somehow, or if you, you have suspect that you have high, uh, high bias, you can reduce bias by increasing the model capacity a bit, making the model more flexible. We'll look at different ways to take a, some, a high bias model, like a machine, uh, sorry, like a linear model, and make it a bit more flexible, give it a bit more power. We'll look at some ways of doing that uh, starting tomorrow. If you want to reduce variance, you can reduce the model capacity or add regularization, which is sort of, um, again, we'll look at some examples later in the course, but it's a way of pulling your model towards simpler solutions. So it's sort of, if you look at all the complexity of this uh, regression tree, sort of pull it away from that extra complexity. And for some models, you actually get a hyperparameter that you can tweak to tune between, choose between high bias and high variance. So if you look at the Regression, uh, K and N regression, you see that if you have just one, uh, if you set K is one, you get this sort of regression tree-like model, which massively overfits. And if you set K very high on the right here, then you get something that almost looks like a linear regression. Uh, so sometimes if you're lucky, you get a hyperparameter that allows you to make this trade-off. And in week five, we'll look at a method for, um, a very powerful method called ensembling which can help you both to reduce variance and to reduce bias. And it's basically the idea of training a bunch of models and combining their judgments. So you get a sort of panel of experts, you let them all do a classification or all do a regression and you combine <coughs> their answers in some smart way. And uh, that can be a really, really powerful way of, of building uh, good models. Uh, so that's really all I had to say about Regression. Uh, there's a surprise for me as well because there's something missing from the uh, menu, namely uh, statistics. We're going to talk about statistics, how to report the results of your experiments and what kind of testing and uh, metrics to report. Uh, question first. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the question is, it's a good question, how do we know the true mean squared error, right? If we want to do this bias variance decomposition, we need to know this value in order to split the error that we got into a bias and a variance. And the answer is we don't. We don't get the true error. I mean, we can repeat this experiment a bunch of times and we can estimate it more accurately, but most of the time we just get one point. <clears throat> and we, uh, so we don't know for one experiment how our error decomposes into error and uh, into bias and variance and irreducible error. Practically, however, we can look at our model and we can reason about our model. So looking at this, we can sort of think, well, I think this is probably a high bias model or I think this is probably a high variance model. And that can help us make some choices and tune things a little better but we don't know. It's, it's one of these values that we don't know. So here's a slide from the uh, first lecture. Uh, talking about statistics, as I said then, machine learning and statistics are extremely related fields. Most of the things that we've done so far predate the name machine learnings and were invented by statisticians to use in statistics. Nevertheless, there are different communities. And what's interesting is when you look at machine learning research, that there's actually relatively little statistics applied to our results. 
we don't tend to do a lot of significance testing. We don't tend to do a lot of uh, student T tests and, and stuff like that. Um, and there's a lot of question whether we should be doing this, whether it's a bad thing that we don't do this. Uh, ongoing discussion probably won't be decided anytime soon. Uh, here are some of the reasons not to do it. So it makes experimentation more difficult. There's a lot of disagreement about how to do it, about what to do, and how to interpret it. Uh, people tend to overestimate the value of statistical analysis. We saw this multiple testing problem, for instance, which um, causes a lot of problems. And we see a lot, as, uh, in psychological literature, you see this a lot, that very strong p-values are reported. But they don't actually indicate that the, the research is true. Um, so we tend to sort of, as a community, go in a slightly different direction of not doing too much statistics and making replication easier. So the ultimate validation of research is replication. And the nice thing about doing computer science research is that replication is very easy. I can just give you my code and you can rerun my experiment if it's not too expensive. Um, so for these reasons, this is sort of the discussion that's ongoing. I won't sort of tell you, well, this is true or this is true. But practically, for this project, this means we don't expect you to do many statistical analysis. Because if it's not that popular in the community, we can't really expect you to be doing them either. Uh, but it is good to look at a little bit of some, uh, some things that you can analyze in all these results. So we have some MSE results that you can report and some error results that you can report. Um, even if you don't do statistical analysis on them, it's good to see what it would look like if you did because it gives you some uh, something to hold on to when you interpret machine learning results. Uh, so let's go into that a little bit. <coughs> the main idea behind statistics is this. The main question that statistics is designed to answer is we've observed a thing, an effect, in this case a result on a model, can that be attributed to real characteristics of the model? Or is it likely that it's just due to random fluctuations in the data or in our process or whatever? There's lots of things that can cause random fluctuations. Did those random fluctuations cause the effect we observed or is the effect fundamentally true and will we see it again if we repeat the same experiment over and over again? That's sort of what basically all statistics is trying to answer. Is trying to answer this question without doing the experiment over and over again, because usually that's very expensive. Uh, and we will start with error bars and do a little audience question. So let's say we have some model. Uh, we measure something. In this case, it's runtime. It doesn't really matter. We get a bunch of values over multiple repeats of the same uh, experiment. So we plot some error bars. We take the mean, so the, the bars here, the bar chart indicates the mean, and the error bars indicate something over that mean. So the question is, what do the error bars indicate? If you see this in a paper, authors don't say what the error bars indicate. What do you conclude? What do they mean? Any guesses? Any wrong guesses? Now oh, that's sort of going deeper than, so the answer is that only A is statistically significantly different from B and C. Uh, so it was a simpler question. Actually, my question was, what value are we plotting here? So which value uh, do the error bars indicate? If the bars indicate the mean? Ah, so different. Uh, Different answers could be the min-max of the data, so the minimum value we've observed to the maximum value, could be the quartiles. Uh, so that's sort of hinting at the correct answer is they could be anything. There is no convention that tells you this is what error bars always mean. Uh, so if you see error bars in a paper and the authors haven't put a little caption on it saying error bars indicate standard deviations, the authors are at fault. If you wrote a paper and you didn't do that, you are at fault. When you plot error bars, you should indicate what they mean. Here are three options, uh, different from the ones you, you mentioned, but uh, those are also possibilities. Um, but three common options are the standard deviation, the standard error, and the confidence interval. 
And I chose these options because they indicate very clearly that they're very different values. And you can see how different they are if we get some extra data. So we have here a very small data set. We take the mean, which comes out to four. These are our error bars. If we plot the standard deviation and we gather some more data, there it is, we gather some more data, we plot the standard deviation, the error bars become more precise. So if we have more data, our estimate of the standard deviation becomes more precise, but the magnitude doesn't change very much. Because the standard deviation is a property of the distribution that generates the data. So if we have more data, we can estimate that property more clearly, but the standard deviation stays the same. So the error bars become more precise, and they might get a little bigger, a little smaller, but basically get closer to the true value. Whereas the standard error and the confidence interval are measures of how sure we are about our estimate of the mean. So we've estimated the mean of the source distribution based on these four points. And if we're not very sure at all, then the standard error is very big and the confidence interval is very big. And if we plot more, if we get more data, then the standard error and the confidence interval will always get smaller. So those are very, very different measures, and you use them in different situations. You use the standard error if you want to indicate how varied your data is, and you use the standard error and the confidence interval if you want to indicate how precise your measurement is, how sure you are that this mean value that you've reported is actually the mean value. So the standard deviation is a measure of spread, and the standard error and confidence interval are measures of confidence, as the name indicates. Uh, in case you don't know, what does the standard error mean? It's important to know this. So let's say you have this distribution that you're measuring from. This could be the, you're measuring the error of your uh, regression, for instance. Uh, as we say, that changes every time you run the experiment. So there's a sort of distribution which you're basically sampling from by running your experiment. And if you run the experiment multiple times, you get a bunch of points. In this case, we are running the experiment multiple times. We get a bunch of points sampled from this distribution, and we compute the mean. There it is. Uh, even though we've sampled a bunch of points, this is still a sample. This still changes if we do the whole thing over and over again. We, uh, if we do the whole thing again, so we sample all these green points again, and then compute the mean again, we get a different mean. So there's still some randomness in the process. So over our mean, our estimate of the mean, I should say, there's also a distribution, which is narrower because we've sampled lots of points. But it's still just an estimate. And if we redo the same process again, we get a slightly different estimate. So the variance of this distribution, this blue line, the variance of that distribution, uh, or the standard deviation, I think, is the standard error of the mean. So it's the standard, error, the standard deviation over our estimate of the mean. So, and you can compute it like this. So the formula is quite easy. If you have the standard deviation of your original distribution for which you're estimating the mean, then you just divide by the square root of the number of samples. And here you see that if you sample a bunch more points at the top here, your value of sigma will just get your estimate of sigma and you estimate sigma from those points, your estimate of sigma will just get more and more precise. We'll get closer to the true sigma for this bell curve. And here you see at the bottom that the bigger n gets, the more points you sample, the smaller this value gets, because you're dividing by a bigger number. So that's the standard error of the mean. And then if you look at this uh, blue curve, and if it happens to be a standard, uh, uh, sorry, a normal distribution, then you will know if you've had some statistics that if you take a number of steps to the left and to the right of the mean, your uh, coverage, the amount of probability mass that is covered, looks like this. So once uh, in one standard deviation from the mean, you cover about 34% of the probability mass, so 60 on uh, 70 on both sides, and then two more gives you 13% more on each side. So if you go sum this all up, if you go two standard deviations from the mean on both sides, within that interval, you capture 
of the probability mass. So in other words, if this is your probability distribution over your estimate of the mean, then you can be 95% confident that within these two standard deviations from this estimate, the true mean resides. So basically, if you have the standard error, you, well, sorry, if you have the standard error, uh, you just double it, that gives you a 95% confidence interval. So in these error bars, the uh, confidence interval is really just twice the standard error. There's not a very special relation between the two. Um, there's a little bit of uh, subtlety in reporting standard error. So what you see a lot is that people say the probability, if you have a 95% confidence interval, the probability that the true mean in the, is within the confidence interval is 95%. Uh, you're not allowed to say that because this is, uh, probability, uh, this is frequent statistics, so probability does not express a belief. Probability expresses uh, repeated experiments. We'll talk about that a bit more in the probability lecture. Basically, the true mean is a fixed value. The true mean doesn't change. The true, we cannot observe the true mean. We can only sort of estimate it by repeated experiments, but the true mean doesn't change. What changes is the confidence interval, because the confidence interval is an estimate derived from uh, estimates over the mean and estimates over the variance. So if we have the true mean here, and we do an experiment giving us a confidence interval, and we redo the experiment, it's the confidence interval that shifts. It's not the mean that shifts around, it's the confidence interval. Uh, so if you want to say it properly, you have to do something like this big, complicated green uh, sentence here. Um, coming back to the, the point we saw on the uh, saw earlier about this, what the uh, error bars say about the significance, uh, it depends a lot on whether you are plotting standard error or confidence interval. Uh, so this is making some assumptions about student t-tests, but basically if you have standard error and you see that the error bars overlap, then you know that there is not a significant, statistically significant difference between A and B. So here, even though A is higher than B, we cannot discount the possibility that this is due to random chance, and we should not think of A as being better than B given the, all the assumptions of the standard uh, significance test. And if you plot confidence intervals, it's the other way around. So if you plot confidence intervals and you observe no overlap, then it applies that there, implies that there is a statistically significant difference. So if you plot confidence intervals and you observe that the error bars don't overlap, then you can say, I'm confident that A is, is actually better than B. That this difference that we've observed is not due to a random fluctuation, but if I run the experiment again, A is still going to be better than B. The converse in both cases is not true. So if you do not see an overlap for a confidence interval, it tells you nothing. And if you do see, uh, if you, sorry, if you do see an overlap for a confidence interval, it tells you nothing. If you do not see an overlap for a standard error, it also tells you nothing. You have to actually do the significance test to figure out which is the case. So this is all means and mean squared errors, but the same thing holds for accuracy. This is where this gets interesting. Even if you don't do significance tests on accuracy, this tells you something about the size of your test set, about size of your, what size of test set is useful and important. Um, so it's the same basic principle if you're measuring accuracy. There's a probability. So if you once you have chosen your classifier, there's a distribution over your data. So if you sample from your data and you apply your classifier, there's a certain probability that you'll, your classifier will be right, and there's a certain probability that your classifier will be wrong. And once you've chosen your classifier, these are immutable values. These are, this is the true accuracy. But you cannot know it. You can only uh, measure it with some error. So what we do is we get a big sample from this data distribution, which is the test data, and we try. We see for every point in our test data, does the uh, classifier get it right, or does the classifier get it wrong? Oh, sorry. And that value, 
the proportion of greens over the whole number of points, that's our, true, uh, our sample accuracy. That's our measured accuracy, which is a measurement of this true accuracy. And just like we saw with the standard error and uh, all of that, if we had the, uh, the luxury of getting another test data, we could repeat this whole process and we would get a slightly different sample of the true accuracy. We get slightly different sample accuracy. So we can plot again what our distribution hypothetically would be on these sample accuracies, which is uh, based on all the assumptions we've made here becomes a binomial distribution. So it looks like this. Uh, it's fixed value, so it's not a continuous space. So we have uh, a distribution over number of misclassifications, basically. And this is the one we've measured, which is the most likely one. But we can also plot a confidence interval about the ones we are most likely to, uh, the values we're most likely to observe. And the confidence interval, just like before, we can plot the confidence interval around the sample accuracy to give us an indication of how sure we are about this sample accuracy. So we get some accuracy, but how far around that accuracy are values also likely to be observed? And that depends on the size of your test set. Depends on two things. Depends on the accuracy of your classifier and on the size of your test set. And what you see is if you have a test set of 100 and you get about 50% accuracy, that's on that by itself doesn't tell you anything, but the corresponding error bar, which we can work out perfectly because we know everything we're doing, the corresponding error bar is this big, so it's quite big. Uh, so in this whole, even though we know it's, if, even though we get 50%, it might easily be 45% or 55%, and it gets a little bit better as the accuracy gets higher, but it's still quite big for a test set of 100%. So even though we don't usually report error bars for, uh, for data sets, if you see something, somebody reporting accuracy scores for a small data set, small test set like uh, 100 instances, and saying, well, my model is better than the other model because we get 95% and they get 94.5%, that's well within this confidence interval. So there's actually no reason to uh, compare models on that fine, fine grain of level. And if you want to compare models on that fine grained level, if you want to make a real difference between 99.1% accuracy and 99.6% accuracy, for instance, then you need at least 10,000 instances. So if you want your confidence interval to be that small, you need a big test set. And even though we don't often report error bars, we do report test set sizes. So it's important to have in the back of your head, this is what they mean. If people give you this kind of test set size, you should be very skeptical. Uh, here are the curves, in case you ever need to look it up, for uh, accuracy and different test set sizes, the size of the confidence interval. So we use uh, statistics in machine learning to do two things, to show confidence, like we've talked about so far, and to show spread. So you can also say, well, I get a very high score, but there is a big variance around that score. So uh, you want to take that with some, uh, uh, yeah, you want to take that into account if you put the model into production. It gets a high score, but there is a lot of variance. Uh, if you want to show spread, you have to think a little bit carefully about the sources of uh, randomness in your process. So obviously your data sampling creates randomness but also your training model, your training process might create randomness. Uh, these are different sources of randomness and sometimes you uh, repeat one of them and not the other. So some of the, sometimes you keep the data set fixed, you repeat the different initializations of the training algorithm. Sometimes you keep the training algorithm, well, no, you can't, keep, you can't do that. You can, uh, but you can also differ both of them and show spread over the, both the data generating process and the training model, training process. So be clear, be clear to describe what it is you repeat when you're uh, reporting variance. When you're reporting variance, describe what you're reporting variance over. <coughs> There's a bunch of uh, resampling methods. 
So if you have, ideally, in the ideal case, you want to sample another data set, practically, that's never something you can do. But what you can do is resample your existing data set. And that gives you a sort of stand-in for another sample from your data set. So bootstrap sampling that we saw earlier, the, we heard about earlier, is a uh, version of that. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways of doing this. It's not super important, but uh, have a look at this slide if you run into this sort of thing. Uh, and we might come back to that uh, in the uh, uh, ensembling, uh, ensembling lecture. Um, so that's all I had to say about statistics. So if you give me just five more minutes, I would like to talk very briefly about the free lunch principle, which is important in machine learning. And basically the free lunch, uh, the no free lunch theorem is a, an answer to the question, what is the best machine learning method in general? So what if I don't care, uh, what if I don't know my data set yet? Which method, which model should I pick? And um, in 1997, Wolpert and McCready uh, came up with this a proof for this statement. Any two optimization algorithms are equivalent when their performance is averaged over all possible problems. So that means if you give me a, data, if you give me a machine learning method, I can give you a data set a task for which its performance will be terrible. Uh, and if I can't, then its performance will be average over all tasks. But if its performance is really good on one task, then there is also another task on which its performance is terrible. So they average out when you average over all tasks. Which means that if you do, for instance, if you want to evaluate two methods, A and B, and you, do, you apply this meta method, which we've been talking about, so you do this uh, training set split, this data set split, so you split your data, you use your training data to do hyperparameter optimization, you pick your best model, so you choose between A and B based on this data set split. Let's call that method C, and you choose whichever performs the best on your test data, that's the one you choose. There's an alternative model, which is sort of perverse, where you use a data split, but instead you choose whichever performs the worst, let's call that method D. Then according to this no free lunch theorem, for every data for every data set for which C performs well, there is another data set for which sorry, for every data set for which C performs best, there is another data set for which D performs best. So even though this is a completely ridiculous counterintuitive thing to do, there are data sets that can be constructed for which D performs best and better than C. Or to look at another example, we've looked at gradient descent a lot. So gradient descent is a way of finding the lowest point in the curve. You want to find the lowest point in the curve on the left, and then gradient descent is great. If you want to find the lowest point in the curve on the right, then gradient descent doesn't do, do anything for you because it first needs to go up the hill, and then when it gets at the top of the hill, then finally it will find the lowest point. So a lot of these examples that the no free lunch theorem gives us are parenthetical, parenthetical uh, examples like this. Uh, that's not the word I'm looking for. Well, uh, are weird looking examples like this. But nevertheless, it means that in general, there's no way to say this is the best machine learning method. It depends on the data, which is sort of bringing us back to the problem of induction. We don't know when machine learning works, why it works. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But we cannot say a priori it works on this data set in this way. Because if we did, we could work that into an ultimate machine learning algorithm. There are some outs, like the idea that there's a universal distribution, so that uh, data sets don't arrive re uniformly random over the space of all possible data sets. They sort of, um, the universe has a preference for some data sets, for simple data, for compressible data, for instance. And the data sets that don't work aren't selected because they look random to us or they are weird. The universe just doesn't generate those data sets. Uh, there's Occam's razor, which is related to this. 
which is saying that when we uh, apply machine learning models, we should, or when we look for explanations of data, we should look for simplicity. We should bias towards simplicity, which is basically saying that the universe generates data sets where a simplicity bias works, where a simplicity bias helps. Um, so that's sort of, this is all probably true, and there is probably, a, a, probably the distribution of data sets is not uniform. So that's our out to the no-free lunch theorem. But there is also the basic idea of the no free lunch principle, which is sort of more of a data, uh, data science principle that we use in practice, which tells us that uh, there is no single best learning method. Whether or not method is good depends on the domain. And this is sort of true in practice. There are some good methods that you can try first. Uh, but basically, you should look at your data and then decide based on your data. This is very different from the no free lunch theorem. Because uh, remember that Alfie Lunch's theorem tells us that data splitting is a bad method to use, whereas that's still used universally. So we all agree that data selection by data splitting is fine and it's a universal algorithm. That sort of goes against the Alfie Lunch theorem, but the Alfie Lunch principle says given data set splitting, you should still try a few different methods. Last slide, which is the principle of inductive bias. I talked earlier about this idea of simplicity, Occam's razor. Uh, the inductive bias of an algorithm is an important term. It tells you the properties of a learning algorithm which explicitly or implicitly make it suitable for certain learning problems. So when we say it depends on the learning problem, which model you should choose, the properties of the learning problem and the property of the machine learning system that you match together to make a learning uh, method that works, that's called the inductive bias of your machine learning model. That finally brings me to the end of the slide. So thank you for your attention, sir, for about all the time. And I will see you on Thursday.